Aaron Magruder is here. He is the creator and artist behind the comic strip The Boondocks. Just two months after its national debut, newspapers in 195 cities have signed up for the strip. It makes it one of the biggest launches in comics history. I am pleased to have Aaron Magruder here and to take note of the fact that not only is it creating a lot of attention, but there are stories about him in both Time and Newsweek. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. You seem so young to do a comic strip. I look younger than I am. <laughs> How old are you? Uh, I'm 25. I just yeah. turned 25. This, as you sat down, you said to me, you have to be careful what you wish for. You do. Uh, the, since the launch, the amount of attention has been overwhelming. It started really about a week before the launch. Most of the client newspapers started calling to do interviews, and it's been basically nonstop since April 19th. Um, and now it's getting into television, and here I am. And, uh, but. Uh, the attention is, uh, is it, it's a bit overwhelming to suddenly be thrust in front of several million readers a day and they all like to talk back. So. Well, not only that, the demand of having to On top to of the demand of, of the actual job, which yeah. is a, more than a full-time job in and of itself, creating yeah. seven strips a week. Um, now, tell me a little bit about you. I uh, was born on the south side of Chicago in 1974. I, I lived there for a few months. My father was in the Air Force and so uh, we moved to Champaign-Urbana after a couple of years, and was after that to Louisville, Kentucky for a couple of years, and then in 1980 we moved to Columbia, Maryland, which is where I still live to this day. And um, you know, I still live with your parents. I still live with my parents. I have not had the time or the money until very recently to move out, and now I just have the money but not the time. Right. And so, when did this sort of desire to draw? I've been drawing my whole life. Um, off and on, not very seriously until high school. Yeah. And in, in high school, I decided I wanted to break into comic books, do like superhero comics, draw for Marvel or whatever, which is a far more difficult task than I thought it was going to be. What makes it difficult? It's a, it's, it really is, a dem is demanding in terms of not only, again, you, your productivity, but your actual artistic skill has to be much better than most people perceive. A comic book art is the most, probably the most difficult thing to do in terms of illustration. You're literally drawing out a movie. Mm -hmm. You get a script, it can be anything, and you have to be able to draw it yeah. quickly. Um, so I was sort of mediocre at that, but not good enough to land a job like I wanted to. And I was in school at the time at the University of Maryland and sort of meandering through classes. Uh, and the only thing I was taking was Afro-American studies classes because I wanted to be an artist and I didn't even plan on graduating. Uh, but um, I was on scholarship. I took a year off to pursue my illustration, and then they said, look, you had to come back, <laughs> or else we're going to take all your money away. Yeah. Uh, so I came back uh, and started playing with the idea of doing the strip in, like, 93, 94, at the same time when I uh, started realizing that since I had taken so many Afro-American studies classes, I might as well declare that to be the major. Yeah. And the two just meshed together. And I found uh, the classes and the coursework did lay a good foundation to do uh, what eventually would become the strip. And um, it actually, its print debut was at the University of Maryland in 19, uh, last week of the semester, 96, December 3rd, I think. Mm -hmm. And then continued on the following semester for a couple months. And then. Um, did somebody see it or what happened? Oh, it was. Uh, or were you sending it off to everybody you could possibly find? That. That happened afterwards. After the two month or so run in the newspaper at, at the University of Maryland, I had had enough to to go through the process of submitting to the half a dozen or so syndicates yeah. which control the newspaper markets, uh, the, the funny pages. And how long did it take you to get a serious, constructive response? Those came pretty quick. Yeah. The serious, constructive responses came pretty quick. The actual contract came a little later. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had, uh, there's about seven or so major syndicates. Um, Two of those, two or three of those really looked long and hard and really wanted to, I think, put it out, but just were too afraid or didn't think they would be able to sell it enough. A few of those, um, a few other syndicates rejected it right out. Uh, some impersonally, some with letters saying the strip was too angry, uh, what have you. Uh, and then uh, Universal Press uh, eventually signed on. Um, I actually met one of their vice presidents by accident in Chicago uh, at, a, at the NABJ convention and sat down with her as soon as I saw her little name tag, Universal Press. I, I assume that's National Association of Black Journalists? Yes, the right. NABJ. Uh, I was there literally just to try to find some support. I was going to sort of talk to black editors who worked at major papers so that 
if I had to self-syndicate, which I was planning on doing, uh, that they would be there and they would push for the strip from within, right. Right. which they, they did do. But I, I also, while I was there, I met this lady, Harriet Choice, and um, I, I kind of pulled her to the side and made her sit down and talk to me and uh, gave her a copy of the, the strip. And um, after she read through it, she went back to the syndicate, who was already considering it, uh, and pushed for them to give me a contract. And they did uh, by the end of that summer. And so you're off and running then? Pretty much. I mean, it's, it's not a fast business. There was, uh, you know, I got that contract fall of 1997, but a lot of legal points had to be worked out. There was a lot of development that had to go on. I, w I hadn't even graduated from school yeah, yet. But that's two years, less than two years ago, and already you've got, you know, these big stories about you. Yeah. And you've got how many movies? How many? How many, how many movies? How many? No, what movies? <laughs> they're they're got, coming. No. They're coming. <laughs> how many newspapers? Did, 195. So that's pretty much roughly. an accurate figure that I had. Yeah, that's, yeah. it's, it's. It, it, the problem is, is that I don't really know the exact number because the foreign sales come in at a delay. So I've heard rumors of Hong Kong and all of this. For those who haven't seen it, what's this about? The strip is essentially a, a racial, social, political satire. It's about a handful of African-American kids who are transplanted to the all-white suburbs. And they have to deal with their surroundings and deal with each other. and. It, it plays out as, a, as an exploration of the American racial dynamic, both interracial and intraracial. And you have these different um, age groups, these different political philosophies of the characters, and different perspectives all sort of clashing and bumping into each other. And that's the best way to, to wrap it up. Excuse my ignorance. Are there any other African Americans? Syndicated cartoonists? Yes. Uh, there are about four or five. Four or five? Yeah. And who are they? Barbara Brandon uh, does a weekly strip called Where I'm Coming From. It's in, I believe, about 30 or some papers. That's a yeah, wild Brandon. guess. Uh, Rob Armstrong is actually the largest in distribution. He has a strip called Jumpstart, which is in, a little, which is in over 300 papers. Yeah. Ray Billingsley uh, does Curtis, which is in over 200 papers. And then there's Stephen Bentley who does a strip called Herb and Jamal, and I'm not exactly familiar with um, how many papers he's in, or if he's even still doing it. And there's Maury Turner, who is really the first black syndicated uh, comic strip creator. And I'm not sure if his strip is still in syndication. I know it does still run in some okay, So you're third or fourth in terms of largest in circulation? Uh, yeah, and in, well, in terms of distribution and number of papers. Right. The actual total circulation, if you were to add up my client papers, it, it could actually be the biggest because I have a lot of very large papers. You have urban papers? Yeah, really, okay. really big city. What else creates controversy? I mean, if you talk about gangster concepts, does that create controversy? Yeah, uh, that whole thing. You know, Riley was really constructed to be a satire on, on contemporary black popular culture and contemporary hip-hop mm -hmm. music and, and the glorification of crime and uh, what have you. And people sort of take it on the surface level that I'm sort of implying that all black people are criminals. I mean, the whole point is with that character is that he's very, very young, uh, you know, maybe like seven or eight. And, you know, he, he's sort of obviously going out of his way to be a thug and, and to look menacing and all of this. And he's not. And uh, that is where the humor lies. Only people, I think, are only looking at it on a very surface level. That, the, Washington, the Washington Post called the strip funny, edgy, hip, and vulnerable, filled with attitude, slang, and irreverent. That's pretty good. That's good. You like it when the Washington Post says that. Yeah. Now, <laughs> the Washington Post might have said also, or I'm asking you, is this successful because, as it is, and had this meteoric success, you might argue, mm -hmm. because it's all those things, funny, edgy, hip, and vulnerable, filled with attitude, slang, and irreverent, and um, African-American. You know... There is, uh, it's, it's, that's a tough question. I mean, some, some people say, well, did you get, just, were you just picked up because it was a black strip? Uh, and is that why it's so? Well, I just posited that it's all these other things first. Right, but, no, but, I know, mean, but. Does it break through because it's African-American? But, you know, I mean, let's, we, we had, you know, this is a, it is certainly a black strip. You know, there is nothing in comics history to indicate that it is at all a benefit to be a black cartoonist or to do a black strip. Those cartoonists that I mentioned, again, Rob Armstrong is the biggest in, in distribution, he's in over 300 papers, and he's been doing it for over 10 years. And you want to compare that to the Peanuts or Calvin Hobbes, which, yeah. is each, which are each in 2,200 papers. So there has been no 
hugely successful black strip in the over 100 year history of the medium. So in that sense, it would, the argument would be, you know, no, it's probably successful in spite of it being a black strip. However, I, can, I must say the timing of when the strip was launched, um, which was the beginning of 1999, was a big time for hip hop. Right. In, in terms of its uh, mainstreaming of hip hop, and Lauryn Hill winning all these Grammys. Right. And so it may have been sold at a really good time. Uh, and hip hop culture is very popular now. And that certainly may have contributed to its success. Do you find any similarity with South Park? You know, I just saw the South Park movie a couple of days ago, and I have to say no. But, no, well, no, actually, about I can't sensibilities? say... How about sensibilities? How about edginess? I can't say about... 100% no, as a matter of fact, because I, I thought the South Park movie actually, you know, if you sifted through all the, the profanity, it made a point about people being hypocritical right. uh, in terms of keeping their kids away from foul language, but in putting all this violence out there. And so I think in that sense, I mean, I, I certainly try to get messages across... I don't do it in nearly the way that South Park does it, but I, uh, I'm not mad at South Park. I don't have any problem with it. You create a comic strip, and you create characters that people interested in like. Immediately, there's all, this, all these things, the spinoffs, merchandise, mm. TV shows, mm -hmm. records, yeah. movies. Uh, all of those things have been discussed. Uh, they are still in the discussion phase, all of them. Is this a lot for the head of a 25-year-old young man? It is, except, you know... You'd say the same thing about Tiger Wood, or you say the same thing about, um, you know, the young world soccer right. stars. Yeah, I mean, to be suddenly, very suddenly thrust yeah. into the spotlight. I, I certainly... Uh, I, know, I know I'm not seeing money anywhere near like Tiger Woods, but... No, <laughs> few of us are. But um, it, it's, uh, it can be overwhelming, but at the same time, and I bet any of these people would tell you, the Tiger Woods or the soccer team, whatever, that you spend so much time working towards that, that, you know, um, you've thought these things through. Like, you know, I've had plenty of times to think about, think about what I'm going to do about merchandising, what I'm going to do about TV, movies, films. And so yeah, it comes at you very suddenly uh, in the sense that, it, or it all comes at you at once. But I, I'm pretty clear in my mind how I want all those things to progress. Right. And I'm not rushing into it. I, I, I'm, we're taking things in a very slow, steady, and careful pace um, because it's early on where you make the big mistakes that cost you millions down the road. The series is called The Boondocks. The artist is Aaron McGruder. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. We'll be right back. Stay with us.